three words. So I kind of let that percolate in my mind and my heart this week. Three words. What three words excite me? What three words impassion me more than maybe anything else? There were some short little phrases that came to my mind that excite me. For example, every time I hear the phrase, dinner is ready, my heart beats just a little bit faster. Those three words excite me. I, I, remember, I remember being able to say these three words 35 years ago. She said yes. Those were great words. And a couple of times I've been able to hear and say, it's a boy or it's a girl. Those words excited me. I'm still waiting to hear the phrase, Dolphins win the Super Bowl. I know those are four words, but don't critique me. We're probably not going to see it during our lifetime. So, three words. In the passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, we see three words that not only changed my life, and I trust have changed your life, but three words that have literally transformed history. And if there are three words that don't impassion you, they don't move you, they haven't changed you, I trust that today that would change in your heart and in your mind. So we're in Mark chapter 16. If you have your Bible, or your iPhone, or your, your, your phone, whatever it is, and I'd encourage you to, to go there. We're going to put it up on the screen. For the past nine weeks, we've been walking through the Gospel of Mark, and we've called our study Journey to the Cross, and we've been traveling from Galilee to Calvary, from the Sea of Galilee to the crucifixion of Jesus, examining His life, and allowing His life and His actions to convict and to mold and to shape ours. And if you've been here the last nine weeks, I trust that, that, that those biblical true stories of Jesus' life have changed you and have transformed you. And today we conclude our study in the Gospel of Mark in the very last chapter. And so I'm going to read the first eight verses Follow along. If you have your Bibles, follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. Verse 1, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought sp spices so they might go and anoint Him. We'll kind of talk about these three ladies in just a few moments. And very early on the first day of the week, on Sunday morning, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They were saying to one another, "Who, when we get there, who's going to roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? And arriving, looking up, they saw, they saw that the stone had already been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Don't be alarmed! You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Notice these three words. He has risen. Would you say those three words with me today? He has risen. Say them with me one more time. He has risen. He is not here. The angel said, see, see the place, look at the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out, fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. and They said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much that we can come and celebrate this day. Lord, this Easter Sunday. When we're reminded that Jesus is alive. 
But Father, we're also reminded that there's nothing really any more significant about this Sunday than any other Sunday. We call this Easter, we call this Resurrection Sunday, but in reality, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Lord, today we celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty. We celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. We celebrate the fact that those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Him have hope no matter what transpires in our life. So I pray you'd help us just to see a couple of really cool things from this passage. But even more importantly, help us to apply these truths to our lives. And help us to trust Jesus. And as the video said, may our lives never be the same because Jesus is alive. Because He is risen. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So so today I want to try to take a fresh look at the resurrection. So I know this is a story uh, about which probably all of us are familiar. And one of the challenges that we have as pastors is to preach this same story year after year. And I've done it now for about 35 years. And so uh, I want to try to take just a little bit of a fresh approach as we look at James, or not to James, Mark's accounts of the resurrection. So we want to take a fresh look and, and kind of ask ourselves the question, how did it affect some of the people who were involved. And and what are the implications for us today? So we're some 2,000 years removed now from the resurrection of Jesus. How does it apply to us? Does it apply to us? Can it? Does it change our lives? You might have noticed that Mark's account is one of the most succinct and one of the most generic of all four Gospels. Mark really only takes eight verses to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. He doesn't go into a lot of detail, and for that reason, most scholars believe that Mark was the very first gospel that was written. We call it Markan priority. But today, I just want to see two truths. And I want these truths to be extremely practical for us today as we pull them from the passage. The first is this. Jesus' death produced heartache. The death of Jesus produced heartache for His followers. As you are well aware, human emotions are volatile. Human emotions are unpredictable. You and I can be emotionally charged one moment and emotionally deflated the next moment. We can be laughing at one moment and crying the next moment. And if you would gauge your emotions, probably during the course of the day, your emotions like mine are a roller coaster. They're up and down. They're high and low. We're happy. We're sad. We actually see that in this passage. In chapters 15 and 16 of Mark, we see that these two chapters are filled with just such a wide variety of human emotions. So, So I kind of want to dig into the text just a little bit, and I want us to see that. So so we see three times in Mark chapter 15 and Mark chapter 16, a group of three ladies that are mentioned. We began chapter 16 making reference to them. So if you look at chapter 16, verse 1, again, it says, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices or bought spices so they might anoint Jesus. Those three ladies are found at least three times in the final two chapters. Let me just kind of give a little bit of update who they are. So if you and I um, read any modern literature, if I asked you who was Mary Magdalene, you probably your first response would be, Why Mary Magdalene was a prostitute that gave her life to Christ. But I want you to know there's no indication, zero indication in the text that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Not only in this text, nowhere in the New Testament. What the Bible says about her was that she was a lady who was possessed by seven demons. Who when she met Jesus, she was freed from that and her life was forever changed. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph or Joseph. 
the mother of two of the disciples. And then Salome. It's not mentioned here, but Salome is the mother of the sons of thunder. James and John. So so these were three of of the ladies who were intimately involved with the ministry and in the life of Jesus. And so as we examine their response, not only in chapter 16, but as we examine their response in chapter 15 as well, we see the heartache, the hurts that these three ladies experienced. Go back with me to chapter 15, and I want you to notice verse 40, because Brad preached on this passage last week, and by the way, he did such a great job. If you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go to our website and watch and listen to Brad's message as Brad laid out the purpose of the crucifixion. But but Mark chapter 15 and verse 40 talks about there, close to the cross, were these three ladies. Mark 15.40, there were also women looking on from a distance, Mark says. Among them, notice, were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and Salome. Try for a second to put yourself in the place of these three women, whose lives had been changed by Jesus. Not only had their lives been changed by Him, but they were fully invested in Him as the Son of God. They were fully invested in Him as the Savior of the world. They'd placed their faith and their trust in Him. And they had dedicated their lives to serving Him. And now all of a sudden, they're standing at the foot of the cross, watching their Messiah, their Redeemer, Suffer, die, and breathe his last breath. I think it's an understatement to say that these ladies were in unbelievable shock as they experienced that. As you come to the end of chapter 15, we once again find these ladies mentioned because we we find that Jesus was taken down off the cross and, and He was buried. And if you look in verses 46 and 47, it talks about Jesus being, uh, being put in a tomb. And verse 47 says, Mary Magdalene and, the Mar- and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where He was laid. Here's what I want you to try to catch. I want you to try to catch the emotion. I want you to try to catch the heartache. Here are these these three devout followers of Jesus who had served Him for some time now. And they're at the foot of the cross watching Him die. And then as He's taken down off the cross, they seemingly, they must follow the body to the tomb. And they see where Jesus is laid in the tomb. Can you sense the grief that these ladies must be experiencing? Then as we came to chapter 16, as they woke up on Easter morning and they took those spices to anoint Jesus and they arrived at the tomb only to see the stone that was rolled away and to see an angel on the inside, the text says very simply that they were alarmed. So they not only experienced shock, they not only experienced grief, but they experienced fear. Verse 5 of chapter 16 says, and they saw, or when they saw the angel, they were alarmed. Verse 8 says, trembling and astonishment had seized them. I would remind you, these were not the only ones who experienced fear after the death of the disciples. If you read further in the New Testament, you find out that Jesus' own 12 disciples had hidden themselves away, fearful for their lives. Can you sense the emotional roller coaster that the followers of Jesus Christ are experiencing from elation on the first day of the week when Jesus marches into the city and the crowd is yelling hosanna hosanna in the highest to his arrest to his trial to his beating to his crucifixion to his burial in just a few short hours their hopes were completely dashed. These ladies experienced unbelievable heartache. There's another man in the passage that Mark mentions who highlights the heartache that was felt by Jesus' disciples. If you go back to Mark chapter 15, verse 43, the Bible mentions a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. 
Verse 43 says this, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God. So here is a respected Jewish leader who is looking, searching for the kingdom of God. The text says, he took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then read verse 46. Try to understand the emotion that is taking place. Joseph of Arimathea, who had asked for the body of Jesus, took the body of Jesus. He bought a linen shroud. And taking Jesus down from the cross, he wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in his own tomb, a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Can you feel the heartache in those verses? Joseph, the text says, had been waiting, like many Jews, had been eagerly waiting for the arrival of the kingdom of God. He, like so many Israelites, longed to hear from God. After all, God had been silent for 400 years. There were 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There had been no prophetic word. There had been no miracles. Not one single, not, not one signal to prove that God was still with them. Then seemingly out of nowhere, this man named Jesus shows up. He appears on the scene. At first, Joseph and the Jewish people merely watched. They skeptically watched and they skeptically listened to the words of Jesus. But soon, crowds began to follow Jesus from place to place. His teaching fascinated the people. Why? They had never heard anyone teach like this, the Bible says. And then there were the miracles. What? Why, no one could deny that, that cripples walked. No one could deny that, that the blind received their sight. Without a doubt, this man Jesus was something special. He was powerful not only in His words, but He was powerful in His actions as well. They began to think, this must be the Messiah. God's kingdom had come. Joseph of Arimathea bought in. This was the promised Messiah. But without warning. He was arrested. He was judged as a common criminal. And he was crucified on a cruel cross. And now Joseph takes his body and wraps his body in a shroud and places him in his own personal tomb. Here's Joseph, filled with grief, filled with discouragement, filled with confusion, preparing the body of Jesus for burial. The heartache of these followers of Jesus must have been palpable. But here's what I want you to catch, and and follow me, I'm going somewhere with all of this, All right, I want you to catch that the heartache the disciples experience, this this pain in their heart, this, this discouragement, this grief, this shock, this confusion, the heartache the disciples experienced was the result of not listening to Jesus' words. It was the result of not understanding God's plan. You might sit back and say, Brian, what in the world are you talking about? Let's not get hard-hearted here. If you were there, you would have been broken-hearted as well. And I get and I feel the emotion. But let us not forget that Jesus had told them exactly what was going to take place. Four times. In the Gospels, four specific times, Jesus tells His disciples of His pending death. And not only His pending death, but His pending resurrection. 
Let me show you one of those verses. Matthew 16 and verse 21. It says, it says, From that time, Jesus began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And what does the text say? And be raised the third day. And so the idea is that Jesus traveled from Galilee. He journeyed towards the cross. He repeatedly was instilling this truth within His disciples. Listen, when we get there, don't get your hopes up. When we get there, the chief priests and the scribes and the religious leaders are not going to accept Me. I want you to understand this. When we get there, I'm going to be rejected. When we arrive, I'm going to be betrayed. When we get there, I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be killed. But don't lose hope. Because three days later, I will rise from the dead. As a matter of fact, He told them, as a matter of fact, He told them that that His temple, if His temple was destroyed, that three days later, it would be rebuilt. Here's what I want you to catch. I'm not being critical of the disciples because we're going to bring it home in just a second. But if they had only listened, if they had only paid attention, if they had only listened, their heartache would have become hope and their grief would have been overcome by faith. Could you imagine if they had taken the words of Jesus to heart and when He died on the cross, there was a a belief in their heart. There was a knowledge in their heart. We remember what Jesus said. I will die, but three days later I will rise again. And if the disciples kind of rallied together and said, okay, bring your tents, bring your camping gear. We are camping at the tomb and we are going to have a tomb watching party until Jesus rises from the dead. Or what if they would have said, hey, we're going to have a celebration service. Come on Saturday night and we're going to have an all night service and we're going to praise and worship waiting for Jesus to come from the tomb. Here's the idea. They could have been faithful instead of being fearful. Listen, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Their heartache was real. And as painful as it was, It was unnecessary. They were grieving in vain. Because as we'll see in just a few moments, the tomb could not hold Jesus. Death could not hold Jesus. And if the disciples would have understood that truth, if their faith would have been stronger than their fear, they would have understood what Jesus is doing. Let me pause there. And say this before you think, man, Brian is being really hard on those disciples. Let me say this. We are very much like the disciples. I am very much like those disciples. You are very much like those disciples. Let me say it this way and then we'll flesh it out real quickly. Because like the disciples, you and I will experience grief, discouragement, and confusion in our lives. Can I get an amen? Has anybody ever been there? Anybody ever lived there for a moment? Something happens in your life and your heart is broken. Something happens in your life and, you, and you're grieving. Something happens in your life you're confused. God, whoa, whoa, whoa. what happened there, God? Everything seemed to be going so well. Everything seemed to be going in, in, in one direction. And then boom, out of nowhere, everything changes and it blows up. God, what in the world are you doing? Listen, I want to I wanna challenge you and encourage you with the thought that like the disciples, you and I in our lifetime will experience heartache. We will experience pain. We will experience grief. And yes, we will experience confusion. We say on a frequent basis that all of us are either coming out of a trial, we're in a trial, or we're about to go into a trial. You might sit back and say, Brian, never happened to me. Fasten your seatbelt. It's going to. You know what it's called? It's called life. It's called life. Our lives, like the disciples, 
are filled with grief, confusion, and discouragement. John 16, we looked at this verse a few weeks ago where Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus said that not post-death, Jesus said that pre-death. Jesus didn't say that post-cross, He said that pre-cross. He didn't say that post-resurrection, He said it pre-resurrection. He said, I have overcome the world. In your moments of heartache, believe in me. In your moments of grief, believe in me. In your moments of confusion, believe in me. When it seems as if I'm dead and you haven't heard from me, believe in me. For I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. So here's what I want you to catch. This is really personal and this is really intimate. How you and I respond to the trials of life depends on our view of Jesus. How we respond to the trials of life depends on our view of Jesus. Do we respond with hope or do we respond with hopelessness? You see, the disciples of Jesus experienced heartache. His death produced heartache. As we say frequently, if that was the end of the story, if we closed the book and that was the end of story, you and I could walk away from here. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if that was it, if our hope in Christ is only in this life, and that's it, why our faith is meaningless, our faith is vain, and we are the most miserable of all people. But I'm here to tell you that's not the end of the story. The tomb is not filled today. The tomb is empty. And that is the message, not only for the disciples, but that is the message for us as well. For just as the death of Jesus produced heartache, so the resurrection of Jesus produces hope. The resurrection of Jesus produces hope. One of the area pastors, our good friend John Ellswick, who pastors Crossway Church, I love. Their church motto is this, and you'll see John, he's always got this t-shirt on that says this, Jesus changes everything. And that's so true. It doesn't matter what situation we're facing in our life. It doesn't matter how much heartache, how much confusion, how much dread we're, we're facing in our life. Jesus and the resurrection changes everything. You see, when we get to chapter 16, the disciples' grief was transformed into joy. Their mourning was transformed. It was turned into dancing. And the same ought to be true for us. You see, as Brad alluded to last week so powerfully, the death of Jesus freed us from our past. The death of Jesus on the cross not only, not only erased the the. Uh, the the accusations that were made against us, but it freed us from all condemnation. When Jesus said, it is finished, He declared that He had provided the way for redemption for each and every one of us. And three days later, when He rose from the tomb, the resurrection gives us hope for the future. You see, the death of Christ frees us from the bondage of our past. And the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope for the future. Let me show you three very personal and very relevant implications from the resurrection that we see in this passage. And I want you to catch these today. And we'll be done quickly. The first is this. Death is defeated. Death is defeated. You say, Brian, where in the world do you see that? I see it in the three words that we noticed right at the beginning. The, the three women came to the tomb. And what did the angel tell them? He has risen. The angel said, He is not here. Follow, follow me today. When those three ladies woke up early Sunday morning, grabbed those spices, and walked to the tomb, and they arrived at the tomb. They fully expected to see the body of Jesus in the tomb. Why is that? Dead bodies stay in tombs, right? 
Do, do we get that? For those of us who have loved ones who have already passed and are, are buried somewhere, when we go to the cemetery to just pay respects to them and we show up there, on the way there, we don't ask ourselves, so what do you think? You think Aunt Mary's going to be there when we get there or not? You think her body will be gone when we get there? No, we never contemplate that. Why? Because dead bodies don't get up and walk out of tombs. It just doesn't happen. Dead bodies stay in tombs. As of yet, no one had overcome death. But Jesus was unlike any other person that had ever died. The grave could not hold Him. He overcame death. We sing that hymn. Let me see if I can remember it. Some of you might remember. Up from the grave He arose. A mighty triumph o'er His foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. And He lives forever with His saints to reign. Why is that? Jesus defeated death. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57. He says, O death, where is your victory? O, or, or excuse me, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says it this way. I love this. Wrap your mind and heart around this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 13, Paul says this, but we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, those who have already passed away. Notice this phrase. I'm not sure. I didn't put that one up there, did I? I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, that you may not grieve as others who don't have hope. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying, because of the resurrection of Jesus, you and I look at death differently. We don't look at death as the final stopping place. We don't look at death as the end all, the terminal experience. We don't look at death that way. Because Jesus overcame death, we look at death differently. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he is the first fruits of those who will be resurrected. So for those of us who are believers, we realize that death is not the final stopping point. It's not. We live after we physically die. Uh, I have a, a good friend named Rick Hornsby. Today, who is at the point of death? Rick's a remarkable man. Rick is actually Kelly Creviston's uncle. Phenomenal man, Rick. I've known Rick for about 15 years. Rick has gone through unbelievable physical trials. About 10 years ago, he had a double lung transplant. No, no one thought Rick would survive a double lung transplant. He did. And then, and then Rick got skin cancer. That, that just seemed to keep growing and it invaded many parts of his body until it invaded his brain and different parts of his body. Well, today Rick is on his deathbed. The doctors have given Rick hours to live. A few days ago, I wrote him a note, just my last note to him. And it's personal. I won't read you what I wrote. I just wanted him to know how much of his example he was to Vicki and I. And I want to follow his example as I experience struggle, struggles and trials. And his wife, Debbie, wrote me back. And I won't read the whole text. This is the bottom of her text. She says, Brian, God is good. The resurrection is in our view. So, so here's Rick's hope. As of the service this morning, Rick still had not passed away. Rick is hoping to go home and meet Jesus on Resurrection Day, on Resurrection Sunday. Listen, this is a family who has been through unbelievable grief. This is a family who has struggled and went through unbelievable trials, but their hope is found in the midst of their trials. Their hope is found in Jesus. 
Their hope is found in the fact that the tomb is empty. That Jesus is alive. And even on Rick's deathbed, Rick and Debbie can boldly say, our hope and our faith is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because in the resurrection, Jesus defeated death. Such a profound truth. Let me show you a second one. Let me sh shift gears for just a little bit. But, but, but this is really good. This is really good. So, so remember when the ladies arrived at the tomb and, and the angel said, He's not here. He has risen. Those three words. And then the angel says, Go and tell the disciples. As a matter of fact, if we can put that verse up. Mark chapter 16 and verse 7. The, the angel says, Go and tell the disciples. And what else? And Peter. So think with me for just a second. So here's the angel telling Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph and, and, and James and Salome, listen, go tell the disciples that Jesus is alive, but make sure you tell Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Let me ask you today, why do you think the angel singled Peter out? Why do you think the angel wanted Peter to know that Jesus was alive. Here's the reason, church. It's going to resonate with us. Peter was in desperate need of grace. Peter needed grace. Just three days before, Peter had denied the Lord. Not once, you know the story, not twice, but three times. As a result of his denial, Peter was broken hearted. Now God wanted Peter specifically to know that Jesus is alive. That forgiveness was available. Yes, he had denied the Lord, but he was not disqualified. The grace of God was greater than Peter's sin. You see, because of Jesus... Dying on the cross and resurrecting from the tomb. Peter was a recipient of God's grace and God's mercy. So, so, so what, what is the tomb? What does the empty tomb accomplish for us? What are the implications? Death is defeated. But not only is death defeated, grace, the grace of God is revealed. By the way, if you're just looking for something to read this afternoon, go to John chapter 21. And in John chapter 21, you'll see Jesus' encounter with Peter there on the Sea of Galilee. Is Peter who had walked away thinking that all was lost. He had betrayed the Lord. Certainly, there's no way that God could ever use him. And Peter had gone back to being a fisherman. And Jesus shows up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee to tell Peter, Peter, you are valuable to me. I love you. I care for you. My grace is greater than your sin. Go and feed my sheep. Man, all you got to get to is Acts chapter 2. And you see that Peter takes that message and preaches one of the greatest messages that has ever been preached at Pentecost. And thousands of people believe in Jesus Christ. What's the message? The message is this. Because of the empty tomb, God's grace is revealed. Does that resonate with you this morning? Does that hit a point in your life today? It certainly does me. And let me cry out to you with truth today. It does not matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how many times you have failed God. God's grace is greater than your sin. Just as Jesus demonstrated to Peter, saying, Peter, I love you. I care for you. Come home. You still have a place at my table. You still can serve me. Today, the message of the empty tomb is this. Come home. You have a place at my table. Because of Jesus. Not because of you. Not because of your goodness. Not because of your ability to transform. Because of Jesus, you can receive forgiveness because of Jesus you can receive new life because of Jesus you have 
hope. Can I get an amen this morning? The empty tomb matters. It matters. It gives hope to the hopeless. It gives hope to the brokenhearted. It gives hope to those of us who have failed repeatedly, realizing that we don't have to be perfect. Jesus is perfect. We can place our faith and trust in Him, and Jesus changes everything. He does. One last thing, and I'm done. The last thing we see in the passage is not only that death is defeated, not only that grace is revealed, We see that you and I are commissioned. You and I are given a responsibility. The angel looks at those three ladies and he he simply says this, go and tell. Go and tell. Go and share. Go and tell that Jesus is alive. Go and tell the disciples. As a matter of fact, tell everybody that the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. You see, that task was passed on to the first Christians. Their task was to be a witness to the resurrection. I won't take the time to do it, but all throughout the beginning of the book of Acts, over and over and over again, and by the way, if you've read the book of Acts, you find that the church, the early church, literally explodes. It grows and explodes and it multiplies and it multiplies and multiplies. And we might sit back and say, man, what in the world was going on there? They were witnesses of the resurrection. Here's one verse, Acts chapter 4 and verse 33, and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The early church took the the resurrection of Jesus with such seriousness, with such passion, that it transformed them, and they went out and told everyone that Jesus was alive. And revival took place. There was a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit of God as the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ pervaded the then known world. They took their commission seriously. So here's my challenge to you and me today. What would happen if we all left here with one voice? The other night, if you were here, we had a great presentation from Revelation Ministries as they did the the passion drama here on the platform. If you didn't see it, you missed it, and we'll have them back in the future. It was absolutely phenomenal. We had had a, a lot of people here Friday and Saturday, and they ended their program with one phenomenal song that simply said this, one voice, one voice. As the followers of Jesus Christ, we have been given one responsibility with one voice. And that one voice is to proclaim to a hopeless world, to a world filled with grief, to a world filled with discouragement, to a world filled with disillusionment, to a world filled with confusion. We as one voice tells them there is hope. And the hope is not found in a political party. It's not found in a nation. It's not found in a denomination. That hope is found in Jesus. In Jesus alone. And Jesus is alive. What would happen if we left here determined, all determined to give witness to the fact that Jesus is alive? Change my life. And it would change yours. So as we wrap this up today and we're done, the simple truth is this. And here's what I want you to catch. The fact that Jesus Christ is risen guarantees eternal life and spiritual victory to those who believe in Him. Let me say it again. The fact that Jesus is risen from the dead guarantees, strong word, I know it, guarantees eternal life and spiritual victory to those who believe in Him. Here's what Jesus said way before His death and His resurrection. John 5, 24, Jesus says this, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from what? From death to life. Just as Jesus passed from death to life, so he offers that hope in Jesus. So so let me ask you today, as Jonas and the team come, in what have you placed your hope? Or in whom have you placed your hope? If you've placed your hope in anything or anyone other than, than Jesus. I'll say this as lovingly as I can. You're hopeless because there is nothing or anyone or anything who can guarantee you and I the future that only Jesus can guarantee. He is risen. Say that with me today. He is risen. Not like you believe it. He is risen. And because he's alive, death is defeated. Grace is revealed. And you and I have a message to share with the world. May God help us. If you're here today, would you stand with me? Go ahead and stand with me. Would you stand? If you're here today and you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, let me take 30 seconds and explain that. I'm not talking about being a member of Hollywood Community Church. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about changing from one religion or one denomination to another. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about if you come to a place in your life where you realize that your actions and your sins offend a holy God. And you repent of those actions. And by faith, you turn to Jesus and Jesus alone as your only living hope. If you've never done that, you can do that right where you're seated. Just in in your own words, confess your sin. Reach out to God. Tell Him how desperately you need Jesus and trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And allow God to change We'll have some of our leaders down front that'll be available to pray with you. If we can pray with you, we'd love to have the opportunity to do that. But let's walk away from here today believing that Jesus is the answer. Father, thank you so much for the message of the resurrection. Today, we hear it, we believe it, and we claim it for our lives. May the message of the resurrection change us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.